Uh, yo, what up? This is Contra, uh, one half of Cartel Madras. This is Eboshi, one half of Cartel Madras, and you're listening to Cabbages, and we are talking about the greatest movie on earth, Leprechaun 5. Leprechaun in the hood. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Shamrocks, a Leprechaun movie podcast, the only unofficial weekly hip-hop podcast about the Leprechaun cinematic universe. I'm your host, Gary Suarez. I'm a freelance music journalist and critic, and I write a twice-weekly hip-hop newsletter called Cabbages, which you can subscribe to for free at cabbages.substack.com. Joining me as always is my co-host, music industry insider Jeffrey Lachlan. Hello, Jeffrey. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm good. I, you know, okay, Leprechaun in the Hood. Can I just jump right into it? Today we'll be talking about Leprechaun in the Hood, the 2000 movie that Entertainment Weekly called Bloody, Broad, and Comically Brutal, Black Exploitation at its best. Ugh. There had to be some negative reviews, right? I don't know if there were any reviews other than this. This was a straight-to-video jam, jam, right? Like yes, this is their third straight-to-video. Okay. It certainly isn't the best of anything i'm not gonna say it's the worst i'm not gonna like go full shit on this film it's not uh it's not superfly at it's, its best it's, it's not the mac it's not it's not what's that one three to get ready that was my jam yeah it's not that it's not it's not foxy brown it's no. not coffee no. you know it's not yeah, sweet back it's, it's, it's not particularly good either it's not even Tim Story's Shaft reboot. Oh man, that thing was, I totally forgot he made that. The, but I, let's not get off on Tim Story again. <laughs> I know, we did a whole episode about Tim episode. Story's Tom and Jerry. And <laughs> we didn't, we managed to go that whole episode without talking about uh, the hot button issue of uh, Tim Story's Shaft reboot, which was Oof. wild, wild movie. Uh, it was maybe maybe we'll really find fun. some time for it uh, in another lifetime. Um, That's but possible. I Lever- don't think... So Leprechaun in the Hood wasn't a good film. No. But I found it wildly intriguing. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of questions. Yeah, go for it. And I can't wait. Well, I feel like I'm just going to save them for our guests. It's interesting because I feel like as this season has gone on, our guests have become more and more despondent. Um, mm-hmm. As we started with uh, Fatboy Sharif, who was thrilled. He this was, was so somebody awesome. who is a horror movie expert, yeah. and he jumped right in. And then we had Dunce Cap in episode two, and he was like, yeah, these aren't really good films, but I like what we're doing here, and let's, let's keep this conversation going. Right. And then we did, we got Beans, Beans of Antipop Consortium right. to talk about Leprechaun 3. Uh, and then in Vegas, and he was just sort of like, uh, I don't quite understand right. why you guys wanted me to watch this movie, but I'm, I'm into it. I, we can talk about I'll it. I'll talk about it, but it, I don't know, man. And then and then Elucid couldn't finish the movie. Hey, Elucid to watch the film. Elucid ref- basically was unable to complete watching Leprechaun in Space, <laughs> and we had to set up a GoFundMe uh, to uh, refund him his uh, original $5 rental fee, and also another $25 to uh, get him to uh, purchase the digital edition of all of the Leprechaun movies mm-hmm. and so that he would watch it. We also raised uh, an additional $220 so uh, by this for emotion, a story of food pantry. So I feel pretty good about that choice. Oh yeah, man. That's but by this, thing. So but by this point, well, but by this yeah, point- At this point, the emotional arc is gonna take Madras they're going to like they're going to be really either angry or just fully despondent like why did i do this is this my career i go on bad podcasts about leprechaun movies now that's what i do you know what i mean i worry that cartel madras are going to walk in here and and like throttle us like again we're on zoom so we won't be right. physically harmed um, but i think that this is leading up to to violence uh, mm. in some way just like people, you know, if you watch like Eric Andre or you watch um, 
you know, like old episodes of Jackass, like sometimes people feel like they've been duped or pranked and they take it out in certain ways. And this podcast is not a prank. I have to make it's, very it's well not. clear. I, we, I'm not like doing this to see if people get mad at me. Look, people are mad at me online every day. It's so I, I have no desire to make more people angry at me in other aspects of my life. To so, me, the leprechaun spreads joy. But that didn't make this a good film. My fear is that by the time we get to the final film mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about, which is Leprechaun 6, Back to the Hood, that we're just going to guess shut down completely. Like they're just going to go quiet on us. Did we do a bad it, thing? We did a Leprechaun hip hop podcast, Jeff. What were we thinking? This is a bad thing. This is, we did a bad, bad thing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is your co-host, Jeffrey Lachlan, and I am here to tell you that we are going to be doing a bit of advertising on the show. All money goes to Brooklyn Community Kitchen, a food bank located in Greenpoint, New York City, Brooklyn. So uh, this week we have on Alex Howell. He's going to tell you a little bit about one of his podcasts. So yeah, I do a show called how do you do fellow kids with uh, another buddy of mine? The rough premise is that we wanted to look into like Gen Z or later trends that I, I would imagine people our age find baffling and our age is uh, we're, we're both Xennials, like, uh, you know, got one foot in Gen X, one foot in the millennial generation. And yeah, we just kind of look into to various topics that Gen Z kids are into. We're teaching you how to be kids badly. Last episode that we did was on uh, Jojo Siwa. Um, some of our you know, more popular episodes were on the K-pop band BTS. Uh, I did an episode on alt TikTok, which is like the weirder side of TikTok. And upcoming episodes are going to be on like uh, popular manga slash anime demon slayer i'm going to do an episode coming up on z tubers so just weird stuff like that and my buddy is a philosophy professor and so like he's always got a you know a constant influx of new kids and he just wants to be able to at least go like i know that that's a thing whenever they bring up you know whatever they're doing and and i'm i'm, I'm a nothing i just <laughs> i just like looking up this kind of stuff and just remind us again the name of the podcast is how do you do fellow kids? Thanks so much for doing this with us, Alex. Uh, we have raised, uh, just from this one, $80 for Brooklyn Community Kitchen. Uh, if anybody else wants to do this, feel free to reach out to the Cabbages Hip Hop Podcast. <laughs> I'm so excited to introduce our guests for today's show. Joining us now is Cartel Madras. Signed to Sun Pop Records and Royal Mountain, the Canadian duo of Contra and Aboshi represent a sonically diverse style of hip hop that incorporates a variety of sounds. Their forthcoming album is called The Serpent and the Tiger. Please welcome Cartel Madras to the show. Hello, and welcome to you both. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Hello, cabbages. We are thrilled to have you here uh, to talk about what is uh, many of our listeners. Uh, and there are many, uh, many of our listeners' favorite movie in the Leprechaun series. So, okay, I, I'm going to have to jump in and interrupt immediately. Can I can I address the cartel? Uh, well, I want to. I just want to say to the cartel, I'm I'm sorry we did this to you. The, what what we've done is, you know, it's excusable. It's not like a horrible crime, but I've seen your reactions on the social medias. It doesn't it doesn't look good. It it was extremely painful. <laughs> Honestly, I'm going to go ahead and say that I think I had 
a much more enjoyable experience than my sister did. Really? And I can just say that right off the bat because I know she hates she hates shit like this. <laughs> like she just <laughs> fucking hates like schlocky horror with like no 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 no, no, no. you know what it is and kind of gore and kind of camp. It's like that's not her. No thing. no no. It, okay no, but this is what it is. This is what it is. Like right from the get, right one. I have to say. I hate puppet stuff. Oh, that's one. It's not a fucking Two, puppet. Like a puppet. No, no, no. I know he's not a puppet, but he looks like a puppet. He is so a man a. inside that. All the on those prosthetics, he is a man. Right, but like it's like it's very like how do I explain it? It reminded me of like okay, there's two type of people. There's people who love like Jim Henson's movie mm-hmm. Labyrinth with David mm. Bowie. You know that movie, right? Or there's people who hate it, and I hate it. Mm. <laughs> And this this movie, like, you know, it, it, to me, it's like the minute I started, I was like, I feel like this is in the same ecosystem, even though like Labyrinth is way more like earnest, sincere storytelling. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll I'll start with. But that. they're both very musical movies as well. You know, obviously, you've got some fantastic songs. They and, are. You know, Real Bowie really brought some great stuff to that. And then in this one, you have the Leprechaun rap. Uh, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I'm trying to see Lep in the hood come to do no exactly. Lep in the hood come to do no good. Like it's a it's a sick hook. I'm not like I'm trying to see Lep in the hood get to Broadway. Like that's that's where I'm at. Like this could be that moment for this franchise. Like because this is the most musical one in the franchise. If you're inviting us to help you write <laughs> Leprechaun the musical. <laughs> Accepted. That is we're in. Except, we're perfect. in. We got nothing perfect. going on. Like I'm gonna start tonight. I'm not busy. This is not busy. Perfect. This is what comes out of our career this during COVID. This is it. <laughs> yeah. This is your. Uh, this is your moment. This is your crossroad. This is your Hamilton. This is our Hamilton. I was about to say this could be. <laughs> yeah. This is our horror Hamilton. Hamilton, and I think, I think we're really on the right track here to getting into something great. And I, I can't wait. Honestly, I think, I think, despite what my sister just said. Somewhere in there, she fucking loves it. Well, I'm thrilled that there maybe we can maybe over the course of this conversation bring that out. Yeah, I want to explore what part she <laughs> loves because it's pretty tough. I'd love for us to get there. <laughs> uh, something that Jeff and I agree on, and one of the only things we agree on uh, with the show, is that we love the Leprechaun. Mm-hmm. But before we go into this one, I'd love to just get a sense, you know, of your experience with the pre- any of the previous films in this series. Yes. So I have seen only one other one before which was i think leprechaun origins which is why when you gary asked us on twitter which was our favorite movie i had said that because that was the only movie that i had seen um interesting aside from that i haven't seen any of them and i think that in getting ready for today like i watched i watched lap five got Mm -hmm. into that yeah did a little bit of perusing of the other ones. Couldn't couldn't commit to a sit down and watch of each of them. Okay. So I would have loved to. Sure. Um, I would say that yeah, I watched Origins. That was horrible. But this was definitely a cut above that. <laughs> I think uh, I think um, a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure this is the one. But I was like getting a tattoo. And the tattoo artist had like Leprechaun 2 on. Like he played Chucky first and then he played Leprechaun, which is like, really? yeah, oh it was God. like a weird. Oh my God, move. no, no, sorry. I just remembered something even crazier because you were also there, bro. Um, We were in <laughs> we were the tattoo. No, artist. Yeah, I was. The ta- no, no. I just remembered we were at, we were in like a basement during an after party after like a show or something. And then someone was just playing random stuff and then i'm pretty sure leprechaun was playing i don't remember which one but i don't think it was the first or the second one um i remember it playing and you were like yo i wish they would just turn this off because like i'm I'm really fucked up right now i don't want to see this (laughs) i was like like, yeah all of the situations you're describing are like the number one and number two ways people have seen the leprechaun right it's always like playing in the it's background. It's just on. Yeah, yeah. Because no, no one would be like, let's watch this to like fuck after. No one on earth would do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, it's been a pretty rough winter. We've been watching these a lot. And that's just not something people yeah, these are know. These are films about loneliness <laughs> for sure. And yeah, 
and they, <laughs> they facilitate their loneliness as well. Um, oddly, we've brought it together. But I will say that one of the, the overarching themes that goes throughout most of the films, not the first one, but for the second through the fifth, for sure, uh, there is a leprechaun sexuality that does come into play. And this one is the most explicit right. of them. Um, because of he actually has sex. the zombie fly girls and yeah, the, uh, right. the, them yeah. basically uh, recruiting uh, women for him to have sex yes. with. And mm-hmm. there's also yeah. the, uh, and I should just point out that this is a film that in our, in our current uh, climate, uh, particularly in, in Me Too times and in just in terms of recognizing the, uh, the issues of, of the day is this doesn't age very well in a lot of places. No, no, not at all. Not at all. There's some disgusting transphobia in this film. Uh, there, there's like oh, yeah. a real issue with Asian stereotypes uh, that come through with the character of Chow. Um, Absolutely. So it's just there is some real issues, and then of course there's just the exploitation side of it, or the black exploitation yeah. side of it, where you have trouble. This is only the second time in a Leprechaun movie where there has been a character with a speaking part that was black. Intriguing. In, in, huh. in this is the, only the second time. The first time was in uh, Leprechaun 4, which is Leprechaun in Space. In Space, right. When we'd had that episode, our, our guest, uh, Elucid, pointed out that it was the same actor who played Juana Man. And so uh, there was something to be said about just sort of teeing up the sort of transphobia, homophobia aspect of it into, mm-hmm. into this. Um, I feel like it was kind of a uh, unintentional foreshadowing. Is there a movie with rap in it that was more obviously written by white people than this film i'm gonna go ahead and say no i'm not i was gonna say something but i'm not gonna say oh. it but Damn but it. <laughs> um, we can always cut oh, it oh yeah i'm like don't worry guys i have i have a beer in hand so i'll, I'll be saying things very soon <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but i actually have a nice cannabis seltzer that sounds amazing yeah, it's actually it's nice. retreat. god i wish i could smoke right now i'm in my mother's house uh oh, no. in my, so so i'm just holed up here with a tea but <laughs> there's probably beer um, in the fridge downstairs no dude i looked for so what? long there's nothing. okay <laughs> you could have just asked dad but like whatever i looked in every single person's oh. fridge there was nothing hmm, interesting times <laughs> i know strange um, uh, but no i was about but, to say like in terms of like because what you were saying jeff is like is there a more whitely written movie taking place in a black community obviously there has been and i would even venture to say that some of our most beloved hip-hop films of all time the writers rooms for those movies are exceptionally mm. white. oh for yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. White. true but i do like the idea of like discussing this movie in in sort of like three different lenses like it yes it's a musical right like we were already talking about it's it's a musical it's also a hip-hop movie Mm -hmm. it's also a movie that takes place with in that sort of ecosystem of the music industry specifically like the rise of an up-and-coming rapper and like and then it's Mm -hmm. also a horror movie and I think like it's it's really funny to view it as like a hip-hop movie which follows those tropes set against the backdrop Mm -hmm. of like a cheesy horror movie because I think that like lends itself to a lot of like the character development in the film. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. I'm just looking up the writer, sir, of the, the director, oh, Rob yes. Sparrow of, uh, of this movie. Cause I was like, what else has he done? And Oof. like, <laughs> Oof. yeah, like basically just a bunch of episodes of criminal mind, <laughs> yep. but, but here's a nice, Cartoon Madras, Rob Spera okay. coincidence, and maybe we were always meant to watch Leprechaun oh. Five. He directed an episode of Criminal Minds called Fear and Loathing. Yo. He named it Fear and Loathing. Sorry, that's our next oh. thing. It's called Fear and Loathing. Huh. I think you guys were destined to be on this episode. I Basically, think so too. We're learning a lot about each other, and I'm really appreciative. And, and I know enough about Jeff, so I appreciate learning about other people. <laughs> but yeah, the, the the two people credited with the screenplay. There's a lot of people credited with the story, which says uh, which says a lot about the way this is set up. But credit with the screenplay are Doug Hall and John Huffman. And Doug Hall, uh, best known uh, these days for his work on Blackish and uh, Grownish, 
uh, oh, story okay. editor. So he's kind of okay. stayed within a certain space, huh. uh, but I think it's an improvement on this. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then John Hoffman uh, is kind of one of those career folks, both actor and writer, um, but mostly on the acting side. Uh, he he did Leprechaun in the Hood, and that was pretty much it for him in terms of writing. Like I think you get one shot at those, and then it's like, okay, thank you. Well, we really appreciate you, dude. But yeah, we're, take, we're just... take take one hike. <laughs> Please. When we often talk about these these films on the show, we're often fixated on the rules. Like, what is it that, like any good horror movie, like yeah. what's the thing to fixate on? Like, okay, you know, there's, he can't, in some of these movies, he can't touch wrought iron. In some of these movies, four leaf clovers are like death to him. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's everything. And in this mm -hmm. film, from the very start, where Ice-T starts pulling baseball bats out of his afro, it's pretty clear that it just, the rules no longer apply. Right, right. It it makes it makes like literally no sense. None whatsoever at all. <laughs> but like I'd say that like once you get it, it's interesting because yes, I, I would view it with the understanding that like the rules are inconsistent. They follow an absurdist logic. Yeah, like I'd say like Ice T grabbing weapons from his fro is like a moment where you right away understand that this movie is like not trying to give you the answer as to how to expect the downfall of the leprechaun in the end and like ultimately we'll get there because like i'm assuming we're gonna like go through this chronologically hopefully because i can only think of it that way otherwise it's... okay wait so I... <laughs> otherwise what? I have a... what is your question I have, a... I have a question this is just about... okay so I, I don't remember any of the other Leprechaun. I don't really remember Leprechaun 2. I just remember like Warwick Davis, Davis's face. Okay. But so. Very memorable. Is a bit, very. <laughs> um, but is it like the Leprechaun is moving through time? And like by time, I mean like. You, like this is like series one to seven. Mm -hmm. Is like chapters one to seven in the Leprechaun's life. Or it's not linear, the films. Okay, so you're you're hitting on something that we've gone through with with every guest, and this is the continuity question of sorts. Right. Uh, the the belief is that there is none. The fact now, is that there's none. There, there is, is no continuity. There is a there is a way that if you want to look through uh, look through a different lens, uh, a fun lens, you can watch them all and sort of try to piece together the total insanity that is the leprechaun killing package so okay at the end he's he's not dead the leprechaun does not die in this film no. so is this is that something that happens in all of the movies is he killed at the end or does he remain alive yes and yes he's killed at the end of he's exploded at the end of a couple of them mm -hmm. uh, but they're like in each film he goes through some uh, adversity and it just doesn't seem to matter like at the end like he's been killed in the middle of like in space he was killed numerous right. times and just like reappeared and was like hello right, right. i'm the leprechaun <laughs> like all right cool uh so there is no real rule that you destroy the leprechaun and you went it the that rule is really weird okay so like there's like in in none of the other ones as far as we're concerned is he like overcome and defeated properly he's either contained or, right. or, or, or made, or, or made to no longer be a threat. So okay. this is the first. This is the first of the films where he essentially wins. Yeah, he's absolutely thriving right. at the end. Like right, he's, right, he's thriving. Right. Like he's living like, his best life. The world is. He's big. truly like right, succeeding right. and making a name for himself. Right. This is the only one that does, and it's like the only part of this I really enjoyed was that the leprechaun was just like. I got what I needed back. Now it's time to wrap. Yeah, like he he mm -hmm. was like I I've received everything that I came into this movie seeking because that was all taken mm -hmm. from me. And now I can basically run my career, run the gambit. Like, let's see where this goes, which I found to be a really, really funny end to the movie. I thought it was just so funny that he's like, I'm about to like- I was, I was dying last Manage <laughs> up in here. I'm in the music industry. I was like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, see that part, see in that sense, this episode was so relevant because I was like, it's like we began as a movie about this leprechaun and then it was like an analysis of the music. Industry. Well, yeah, that's that's like, that's what I was saying. <laughs> it's like, it's like a hip hop movie that really does sort of like even in passing discuss the hilarious like 
corruption of the music industry and here right like, right what's his face like barry grady the a and r guy yeah like, that of was dope like, of yeah. dope disc dope yeah. disc productions uh-huh. dope disc productions like that was that was so funny because it's like okay is he, okay like there could be any number of people that he is like a reference to like he could be like maddie c paul stewart but i think mm-hmm. like his character coming in and just being like haha yeah i'm like vice president of a and r at dope <laughs> disc and it was like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i loved seeing like the trio's reaction to that because they were truly like oh my god he's here in front of us he's here and he's about they to were to awesome. scout us he's going to scout us right now and like that was yeah. just like a that was like one of those moments that like you see and it's like yeah that that's you know that is actually very realistic if you know someone in a and r is somewhere you're gonna be thrilled you're gonna give them what they want I also liked the kind of tension between like Postmaster P and Stray Bullet in how Postmaster P wanted to make like terrible corny rap Mm -hmm. and like Stray Bullet was like, no, like we we have to make way better music. This guy's going to sign. I liked that. That was like, that felt like, you know, it's like there's these moments in the movie that I'm like, okay, who wrote this part in? Like what, what is the, how did this part get into the film? Mac Daddy's business model was like that for me. Uh, uh, I ain't with that save the fucking hood bullshit. Yeah, she, right. All right, that shit is whack. All right, that was like, okay, that I bet somebody actually said that shit. I know. I was like, okay, yeah. this is some. This is I some feel like writing. He wrote that. Like he improv. That. <laughs> right. Right. Like oh, totally. some, some people said that shit to me in a meeting. So I'll just do that instead of what you wrote. Yeah, like <laughs> that. I felt like that was very much like speaking to an element in the music industry that has happened in various iterations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the reality of having somebody like Ice-T in this in this movie is you have somebody who has a, a, a lengthy rap career by that point, you know, and a lengthy music career because you know, that's already he's gone through body count. He's gone through so much uh, of his experience in multiple sides of the business on majors and on independent labels by that stage. So he's definitely mm-hmm. a, a jaded figure in that respect and found a certain uh, found a certain niche in acting, you know, being on you know, Law and Order SVU forever. Um, and I think that he had a very clear understanding of how fucked up the music business was and was happy to, you know, get some digs in there, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also like the very idea that this flute, this, you know, magic flute exists that makes people like shitty music. Um, right. Um, <laughs> I think is the biggest, is the most poignant commentary uh, on the music business totally. because it clearly is saying like this stuff is fucking trash not just what the postman p the postmaster p and stray bullet are doing but just the artists who are doing well on uh, on ice t's uh, mac daddy onassis's uh record label it's just like there's crap it's not particularly good music uh, but it's doing well what what could explain that a magic flute from a leprechaun yo totally it's it's so yeah. funny because like you see like when when they when they like the trio like stray butch and post finally meet like mac daddy and go into his like house and stuff it's like you're like oh he's he's so successful he's a big name in the industry Mm -hmm. he's like a label exec but he's also a rapper and it's funny because it's so true because the three are, are listening to him and looking at him as if he's this like man who's like made this name for himself and Honestly, it is as if by by random chance and occurrence, he has become this simply because of that magic flute. Mm. However, it's like, I will say that like, it's, it's Mac Daddy went searching for that, right? right? Like that, that's sort of like in the lead up to the first scene, it's like they are looking for something because they have a treasure map, like Mac and Slug have a treasure map. Right. And they're looking for something and they find it because Mac Daddy is a kind of a piece of shit and is about to beat his friend up because his friend's fake map didn't work and didn't lead them to anything he like takes him through the wall mm-hmm. and he's just like oh my god we found what i'm assuming I, I, I had not considered in my watches of this film that he knew what he was looking for and that was the one particular oh thing. absolutely i didn't put that together so that means that when he had those three dudes in his office that the music he knew the music was trash was like whatever i have the flu Mm. these dudes are hungry enough to where they'll they'll give me money 
Yeah, because they were so bad, right? right. When they were doing the audition, it was so shit. Because I just can't, I, maybe it's me and I'm, I'm naive, but I can't see Ice-T being in this movie and being like, I'm not approving these dudes. Like, I think... That hurts me as a person, <laughs> like a real person. Like, I think, I think like, what? because honestly, what Mac could do if he wants to make the most money is just like do the flute thing for all of the artists on his label. But he was actually, I think, giving advice to the trio because like he was giving them like, he was like, don't do this and that, do this because that's what's selling and that's what's going to make me money if I sign you to my label, which is interesting because Mm -hmm. he could technically just like lend them the flute for each show they're doing. Yeah, I think. Maybe he's also a hype man. Yeah, like maybe he could, like, I think like theoretically he could use the flute for all of his artists that he signed because that would make them extremely more profitable. But he was actually giving them advice based on their lyrical content to make them more marketable. Also correct. Mm. Mm -hmm. My theory going into this is that I thought at least at some stage in this, maybe not so much when we meet Mac Daddy all these years later, but at some stage in his early success, I assume that the flute was maybe, you know, recorded in the studio underneath some of the songs and uh, it was kind of just like, you know, you know, backwards master or otherwise hidden in this music. So it was attracting people to it. Well, uh, I have, I have an immediate rebuttal to that. Please. Which is that when they're at Reverend Hansen's church, they're trying to record the flute. Mm-hmm. They're trying to sample it and they can't. Mm. Oh yeah. They can't actually record it because it, it like has that like ephemeral quality to it, which means that it can only be used in person. They were trying to get the it. Leprechaun's magic is hard exactly. to Exactly. It's hard to um like bottle. You can't bottle the magic. You can't mm-hmm. bottle the luck of the Irish, as they say. It's true. So I think like when they were at the church, they were trying to, because that's what um Butch was doing. He was trying to record yeah post playing it and they were like shit we can't even sample this like we can't even use this like that we have to just bring it with us because i think what they were trying to do was figure out a way to use it in perpetuity so that they could get mac off their tail because they were like butch was saying every second he could mac is chasing us mac is gonna fucking kill us if we don't give him this thing back we're dead and post is like i don't care right now i'm just trying to use this and if I think Butch was under the impression if they could record it and keep it and use it for their purposes, they could at least give Mac what he wanted so he could be off their tail, but Mm. they weren't able to do that. And so at that moment, I think that was, I think they could have probably highlighted that element a little bit better in the film so that it was clearer for the audience because that was kind of brushed over so quickly with like Reverend Hanson coming back down and being like, what are you guys doing? I'm not going to keep this leprechaun locked up in my safe in my church. That's <laughs> fucking crazy. <laughs> to, to be fair to him, like good decision. My yeah. Back. Like that thing, it's not a great thing to just keep around. I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't think look. that's, I don't think that's safe. I don't think. So like kudos to him to have enough control of the situation. Be like young men. No, no, you will not be keeping this monster. You here. can't keep your leprechaun in my house of God. And, and that's not even right. the strangest thing that happens in that church. Um, no, it's not. Because Coolio shows Coolio up. Shows up. Uh, yeah, Coolio um, does come Coolio in. shows up. And uh, as it turns out, that cameo is even stranger than you might think. Uh, so in a, in a Vice interview he did, he was asked about that cameo. And he said, somebody came with a camera and said, hey, man, I want to put you on this movie. We weren't even in a church. We were in my fucking kitchen. They filmed it and they did their a little Hollywood movie magic, superimposed type shit, and put us in there. We weren't even in a church. He wasn't even in the church. This is mind blowing for that era. They CGI'd him into. The they spent money. Wait, 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 wait. Coolio was in the film. Wait, they CGI'd okay. him. Okay, wait, no, no. I think. Okay, wait, wait. Back this up, is back so up. fresh in my memory. They have a shot where Post is saying is that Coolio? And then the camera changes its pan. Well, it actually just gives you a a frontal of like Coolio's face. Mm -hmm. And you, it's like such an immediately recognizable shot. It's like got him in his hair and it's like, oh, right, Coolio. And then it takes you back to the wide angle of the church audience. And then I think in the back, they either might have 
put in the money to see J.I. Coolio in the back. But I think he's also so far back that they might have been able to, like, they yeah, they that. might have been able to replicate, like, okay. his perfect hair on someone else. Like, they might have just, like, put in the money to get a really good hairstylist for that moment. Because I remember seeing that. There's still an amount of money that was Absolutely. spent. This is a notoriously cheap franchise. <laughs> uh, and, and to put money into the idea that, like, we got to make sure the fake Coolio has sick hair is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> to save that moment of Coolio waving at the back. Of Keep the in mind that they, you know, where they choose to spend their money is key because most of this film is filmed on old Cagney and Lacey sets, untouched from the Cagney and Lacey times. Oh. So they're basically mm-hmm. using set pieces that exist. So not only does a lot of this feel old, uh, in terms of just the way this movie is set up and you know, the music, certainly. But this, the locations are from old Cagney and Lacey episodes. Interesting. So cool. The movie's ridiculous. Because, like, the <laughs> restaurant that they're auditioning for their Las Vegas show in mm. is, like, hilarious. But also a venue that... Okay, that restaurant well is, like, we've, we've performed. Yeah, we've, exactly. <laughs> I, would t- I would totally like, see you play there. I would totally go see you play there. <laughs> Uh, I, I would be. I would go to a yeah, cartel show there. And we would we would like build that, that as an intimate venue. Like <laughs> totally, totally. That scene was so triggering. I was like, oh, the the rest, the many a cafes we had to play at and like pretend mm. we did it oh on purpose. Oh my god! No, I remember like when when the second audition they do in the restaurant is like going really well and like the people are like dancing because it's like popping off. I was watching it and I was like, oh, this is a show that we've done like this is show we've done <laughs> where we're like all right let's get it going <laughs> like let's make it happen <laughs> do either of you know much about science i know jeff doesn't but do either of you know much about science uh, that's a low blow i know a little about science rocks are hard the only science thing i can say in relation to this movie with any confidence is that nitrogen triiodide is not storable. It's not transportable. Mm -hmm. And you cannot use it for controlled explosions, which means that Butch is a fucking genius for being able to use it at all during their first audition. I think Butch is the unsung hero of this film. I think personally, well, he is the unsung hero, but I'm going to go ahead and say, no, sorry, before I even go ahead and say anything, Gary, I'm so sorry. Why are we asking that question? I was asking because of, because (laughs) I was asking because of Butch. I was asking because of Butch. There's, there's a line that I wrote down Um, during the scene where they are uh, hiding. He goes into this little speech and he says, the mix of a douche and a jelly is very combustible. Combustibility plus electricity equals flammability. Now I'm not a science person. I don't particularly know what's going on uh, when that happens. So I just wanted to get a sense of either of you thought that there was anything to that. But the fact that you're pointing out an earlier situation where his science skills were above what our understanding of-, of So it was always lingering in the back that he was, you know, they foreshadow it, that he's, he's good, good at, at science. science. But I do think that that scene was a crock of shit because there's no way douche and lube is combustible. If lube was combustible, we would have a lot more problems in the world yeah if, if lube true. was seriously combustible in in mixture with something else that's you know like with douching liquid like if those two things were combustible combined together we have a problem here we have a lot more 911 calls than we can anticipate so <laughs> i don't mm. know i'm no i'm with this like if you put summer's eve and ky together and we're going to explode i don't i feel like those are in the same area exactly of the exactly like that's already that's a that's a recipe for disaster for mm. anybody ever. There's nothing about that in my copy of the Anarchist Cookbook, so I have to. Because <laughs> those are both like household items for yeah people. I mean, I would say on the record, if you are a lady, do not use douching liquid. It's not good. However, <laughs> a lot of people have douching mm. liquid at home for other reasons, and everyone has lube so hopefully those two things aren't super combustible or flammable so let's go back because there was a point that we that that you were making before about uh, it was being bantered about about, is butch the uh the hero of this film and i'm wondering Mm. what people's thoughts are about that because you know he does save the day a few times and he does uh, become a sacrifice towards the end yes 
obviously. And, and unfortunately, it is really after he's gone, then things really do go to shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was also the best rapper. Um, you mean Stray Bullet was the best rapper because that was a no brainer. Yes. Yeah, Stray. Yeah. Stray Bullet, Stray Bullet was, was obviously. Oh, did I confuse these two? No, rappers? it's okay. It's okay, Jeff. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> they look completely <laughs> they, different. They were all very, very, very bad rappers. <laughs> Uh, like postmaster was the like, worst i would he say was truly hopeless like stray was yeah. carrying the weight of the trail on his shoulders with his ambition yeah, and his he was like and he was charismatic he's, right. charismatic. he's charismatic he has so much ambition he knows this is a doggy dog industry he's like i'm gonna do the thing i'm gonna like fucking say anything to get there do i agree with that not necessarily but Post was like, I'm bad at rapping. I have bad bars. <laughs> and I'm going to be as uncharismatic as possible. And Bl- Not to mention a constant spoil sport. Exactly. Constant spoil sport. Totally. Or just late to the party. It's like, they were about to rob without you. And then you slowly show up. It's like, don't worry. You're not the hero, Post. You couldn't don't save your friends. You. You're not the hero. I feel like on the list of things, it's probably not the coolest to be late to. Exactly. Probably. It's also robbery and theft are like uh, near the top. You know, be there on time. There may be a plan, even though there wasn't. The plan was just go to that building. <laughs> the plan right. was just like show up, <laughs> show up and just rob. Him. Just take that shit. <laughs> but it's like I would say actually the strengths of the group is like yes, but which is a science whiz, and also like sure the maestro producer of the team. And Stray is like, you know, like he's the go-getter and the one with the most onstage presence and energy. Mm-hmm. With that. Post is the dude that is just so righteous and annoying. I just, I hate guys and like Post. And also, like, actually. Post, and they're always the shittiest yeah, rappers. <laughs> this mm. is so true. And Post is also the most transphobic of the three of them. Because he was the only one to make a comment that is like super transphobic of the lot. It's like, yes, you could palpably assess the discomfort all three of them had with Fontaine, but mm-hmm. it was only Post that said a transphobic comment about Fontaine mm-hmm. when they were being killed by Lubden. So I'm going to go ahead and say Post, despite being the one that's like, oh yeah, positivity, conscious, I'm the one that cares about all this stuff is actually the biggest piece of shit in the group. Which is a real, real thing. That's It's always like that. It's the guy who's like that is always the biggest piece of shit. Yeah, it's like, it's funny because you think about like, and I know this is, this is an aside, but like he's meant to be like some version of the conscious rapper, whether the writers of this film understood what a conscious rapper was. Like he's supposed to be some version of that. And it's like, I think about what happened with, you know, with Talib Kweli where he was going after this young woman online, like mercilessly. And it's just like, you're supposed to be the guy who talks about black girl pain. And like, you're like shitting on this person. And then like, I think about like all the, the, the rhyme sayers stuff, the boycott rhyme sayers movement. Mm -hmm. And I think about just like how it's like, these are supposed to be the people who are, you know, quote unquote, you know, woke about this shit. And they're like some of the, some of the most notorious, uh, you know, offenders in them in these cases. I mean, even even holier than thou. Like, it's, yeah, it's holier than thou, and even even that's, most that's my favorite phrase. It's holier than thou. It's super holy. He spends what, the like, entire film being better than everybody else because he doesn't go on a microphone and say wild shit. And it's also it's so funny because it's like even most recently, like we have like a J Cole type coming after No Name, exactly. and it's like, what the oh, hell is right. this, dude? Why did you do like that? what was the reason? <laughs> what was the reason? That was that was like the dumbest, dumbest move of his career to go after no name. During the height of the protest, like to go after the most like openly leftist vocal uh, rapper, right? Public intellectual in the game, essentially. Absolutely. It's oh, it's wow. interesting because it's like, yeah. For people who are at J. Cole fans, it was like, oh, there it is, guys. By the way, yeah, we were like this is what this is what we've been saying. Totally, we've, totally. We've been noticing for years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I always think about there's that lyric he did on that Jeremiah song that's just like absolutely disgusting. Like he wrote a disgusting guest verse on that Jeremiah song. And it's just like, I go, I go like, how do you reconcile that? And then when you see what happened with No Name, you're like, okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. That That's exactly yeah. who he is. That's who he is. Okay, now we understand. That's who he yeah. is. Yeah, now yeah. we get it. It's so crazy. It's so crazy because it's like, yeah, it's, it's honestly 
that is a, a trope and I'm, I don't think I'm willing to give the writers of, of Web5, um, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. We could say maybe they are sort of tying Postmaster P into that trope by making him the only one that was vocally transphobic in the entire movie. That's interesting. It's like, yes, the script itself was transphobic, so I'm not willing to give the writers that leeway. Mm. But it is, it is interesting mm. for them to choose sort of the hero of the group to be the one that's also kind of well i mean it's it's also interesting that this was the first film with black people in it really and they lost in the leprechaun one for the first time yeah so it's um, it, there's a whole lot going on <laughs> in that right. field that like if that's a real thing if that really happened i i want them on the show to talk about it it's also it also just makes the most sense for like a sort of like pseudo black exploitation movie to mm -hmm. ultimately have a finale in which the main antagonist is profiting off of the black experience. It's like, it makes sense for the leprechaun to ultimately be a music manager in the game. It's like- <laughs> And the best rapper in the film that's not named Ice-T. I will fight you, Jeff. <laughs> Can you give the leprechaun best like, in the film? I won't allow it. There was, there was even probably like one eight bar that Stray did that was remotely it was better. So terrible. No, there was a there was like okay, he said this. I remember the leprechaun said this one thing, and it was like he said and it made no sense. He was like, "Stealing me gold's a sure way to grow old." Which makes no sense. Doesn't he kill you if you steal his gold? So you won't grow old. Right? Perhaps he'll make you grow like old right where you stand and you'll end up dying. Yeah, that one didn't really work. I remember that one. It's yeah. it's That's, not as it's, it's not, not as uh work. and you know, this is good because in the last film he stopped rhyming. Uh, in Leprechaun mm -hmm. in Space, he wasn't rhyming. He was doing like Shakespearean soliloquies instead. Mm. That makes more sense. And in this one, he's back to rhyming. And he says things like, unhand me gold, you thieving hoods. You got more loot than Tiger Woods. <laughs> Jesus. Wow. And that's, wow. and that's not even in the Leprechaun rap at the end. That is just some, he's just, he's just spitting bars. That was his first rhyme. He's spitting bars all throughout this film. The whole time. Yeah. like He rhymes a lot in the films until the fourth one. Well, I and think then in this one, he's like only right. It's almost exclusively right. Maybe they were trying to, maybe they're trying to show some contrast there. Like maybe they were trying to give a little bit of break in terms of like how many stupid couplets can Lubden do between the fourth and fifth. Maybe they're trying to give you that fourth one as a breather where they're like, oh, here's a little bit of him not doing the couplet. I think you ascribe a level of kindness to the writers and creators. Yeah, you know what? Not exist, but I really appreciate that you like see the good in people. That's amazing. Well, leprechauns aren't people. Like, Let's don't lose that sure spirit. We understand leprechauns are magical <laughs> creatures. Um, so. True. It's true. Oh, true. You you agree this true. time, Jeff? Thankfully. Yeah, you know, I have like I, look. There's a whole spectrum involved in like what I think the leprechaun is, because there's like five different leprechauns at this point. Of the films, when you think about the differences between them, this one has the, the most kills, has the largest kill count. Although I have Great. questions yeah. about a couple of the kills. Wait, nine is the largest kill count? 10 is the largest kill count. Interesting. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through, but I have a couple that I have questions about. Um, so there's totally. there's Slug in the beginning, which is the death by the hair pick. There's the bartender who's uh, credited as electrocuted man. There's Jackie D who's murdered by his uh, uh, former partner, Jackie C. Uh, an illusion of her, I should say. There's right. Chow's death, which is a little confusing because he's choked to death by one hand, but then dismembered and jarred. So I don't know if it was the choking that killed him or the dismembering, but something happened there. I don't really quite understand Fontaine's death because I can't tell, given what we learn later about the the leprechaun having women brought to him, is, is Fontaine choked to death? Is Fontaine fucked to death? I don't Fontaine quite understand. Fontaine fucked to, well, well, Fontaine, yeah, Fontaine is fucked to death. Okay, I believe. I, that's what I'm trying to get an understanding of it, if people with people's perspective on that, because I, I I feel like that foreshadows what comes later is understanding these women come up, you know, with that freight elevator and they'll come back. We're to believe yeah. that the that the magical leprechaun just kills it, literally. No, oh, I think it's it's so horrible that they just die. 
Oh, it's the other end of the spectrum. Oh, <laughs> it's so horrible. Lot, that honestly makes a it lot more sense. Like, what am I doing with they my hate life? It. And they just, their spirit leaves them. Yeah, I'm a pretty open-minded person, but I think sex with a leprechaun <laughs> would, would actually be the death of me. Um, then there's the bodyguard whose chest explodes. I love the exploding chests that happened in this film. Yeah, that was a that was a lot. Um, that was a lot. For the, me. the reverend uh, who has the leprechaun hand goes through his back and out the front of his chest. But first, he he is seduced. Yes, first he's seduced by one of the uh, zombie fly girls. Yes, and and you know they look great. Zombie fly girls. It was exceedingly hot. easy to enter to to get him to seduce him. Yes. It was oh, really, yeah. It was. He walked in and was like, hi. And he was like, absolutely. Let's do it here yeah. and now. And like people walk in for sanctuary, they're just going to see it. Yeah. He was <laughs> like, uh, me, a reverend? I think not. Uh, look, you don't <laughs> name your church Denzel's Holiness Tabernacle Church without good intent <laughs> or bad intent, I should say. I'm with you. Then of course, straight bullet is, is so suicide by life. Tragic. Honestly, tragic. Honestly, tragic. Uh, Butch is shot by Mac Daddy, very unfortunate. Um, and then Mac Daddy, uh, who is shot by Post and then has his insides exploded by lip. So again, once yeah. again, another explosion. So that's Ted. That's I yelled when Butch died. I was very upset. Yeah, Butch's death was hard. Stray's bullet, <laughs> Stray bullets, bullet to his own head was really hard too. I was, yeah, that was, that was a lot for me. Because that was like, wow, that, like, you could have done anything. You exploded some guy's chest and you just make this guy shoot himself and some of his friends. That's me. That was, That's yeah, the, that was the like cruelty. Fun spirited leprechaun that I've come to know in the series. I also found, okay, so this is an interesting thing I noticed during Butch's death, which to me was a bit of, I don't know, again, maybe this is a little bit of undue kindness towards the writers, but I found it to be a powerful moment. It was when Butch was dying, Post was wearing sort of his drag moment. Um, he had his like full face of makeup. Yeah. His, his wig was unfortunately removed, but he still looked, you know, very beautiful. And he was wearing a very beautiful dress. Mm -hmm. And he was really crying over the death of his friend. And I just thought that that was a really powerful moment of like him feeling the loss of his friend while being in drag. And it was not at all emasculating for him to be wearing that full face of makeup and mourning the loss of his friend. And I thought it was almost redeeming for his earlier slights and the things that he had said, because mm -hmm. even them getting into drag to get the leprechaun, kill Mac, all of that, that build up there was, you know, not even, I mean, obviously at the time and with the writing and the style of writing, and the way the movie's laid out, like, yes, you can tell that it was written and played for laughs. However, while they were doing it, it wasn't even overly camped up. It was like they're putting on drag yeah. because they obviously have to find their way into the bar, get up on the elevator, get into the sure. room. Mm -hmm. And right. But the movie has so many moments like that where it's like super campy. And then like there's this like moment where you're like, OK, is this is this like it, it's like you can tell it's been written by so many people because like once in a while a writer comes in and puts something in there that's like such a curveball emotionally to the rest mm -hmm. of the film. True, and and I think that that is one of those moments because when Post is in his dress and the wig and makeup and he and he's like, "Fuck Mac Daddy," and he like really says it, and it, it's it's a very powerful moment but he also looks really beautiful. I think that's like a really great moment of like contrast into like what they were originally saying about things like this in relation yeah. to that. Like I thought it was just like, oh, okay. Like this is like an unexpected amount of sincerity and sensitivity with these two right now. I just thought it was, I think it was, it showed more range than I was expecting at that moment. Also, this brings up a, a question that I have mm -hmm. for everyone. If the if the raps in this movie were okay, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be just like an okay movie? Because like Honestly? the acting wasn't awful. These people acted. I see is fun to watch act. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Like there's, there's you know what? You're right. Well, like, and if you watch all, all of them up to this point. That is, everyone is a stack of wood. Just I think you're right. Sucks. Like, and then this one, 
a lot of people can really act in this. True. It's like it's like it's like the characters are one dimensional, but right. they're one dimensionally believable. You know what I mean? Sure. Like no one's not acting the way it's written, right? Like the issue isn't the acting. The issue is, you know, quite possibly the entire premise. But, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> granted, but I, I just feel like if the raps were pretty good, we would have been like, yo, this was like a fun ass movie and it was stupid and we had a good time. I agree with that. Because the raps were so hookless and so terrible and half the time didn't really even have bars in them, <laughs> that it was like, you couldn't, like if you can hire a hairstylist to make a fake Coolio, Coolio look like Coolio, then you can probably hire a dude to write competent raps that these actors mm-hmm. can perform. I completely agree with that. I actually completely agree with that. Like they could have actually put a budget into the soundtrack of this movie in, in a much more significant way and not even a budget, you know, like this soundtrack could have been better. Yeah. The musical component could have been better. Like all of that could have been woven into the storytelling in a way that was much more remarkable and could have like integrated the two genres of film that they were trying to integrate in a much more interesting way, in a much more compelling way, I would say, because definitely the film was interesting from start to finish. And when I say like interesting, I mean, interesting, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which I am so glad you understood. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Listening. (laughs) But I'd say that like, yeah, absolutely, Jeff. It's like, we've got Ice, we've got Anthony, we've got Rashawn, we've got Dan. Like these are all people doing actually like pretty good acting couple pros in there couple pros in there and like it's it's interesting because we have like anthony playing post who's obviously like the analog to trey styles and boys in the hood played by kuba right 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 that is like the obvious analog in this movie in terms of like here is a hip-hop movie here is a movie which takes place in the hood and that's the two characters we can link together and, you know, Postmaster isn't uh, entirely unconvincing, but he's also not written in a way which gives him a lot of believability or even likability. Like, he mm. is the most annoying. It's like, Stray Bullet is much more likable. He's much more endearing and, and charismatic. And I think, like, if they had just focused in on why Post was positive rapper or even like why those things matter to him it yeah been, a little bit of backstory would have been like nice. we know yeah. his mom is super sweet right and she probably like raised him to be like a really nice guy who wants to do good things however yeah. for some reason he's not the nicest guy he just thinks that by being a positive rapper he's going to change things virtuous idiocy exactly mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's it's so close to being fun and yet four remains my favorite leprechaun in space despite the no rhyming which is real a real <laughs> stick in the mud it was my favorite of all of them i leprechaun in the hood was it was a movie i don't know i we're, we're giving many- it a lot of credit because we're like having fun talking about it and that's sort of the magic of the leprechaun movies in general but man this, the first time I watched this, I was really, really disturbed. I was like, this is just awful. The second time I started coming around to a few people, and that's when I discovered my love for Butch, mm. the hero of this film. <laughs> the true unsung hero of this the film. The Jesus Christ of this film. Came up with all kinds of great ideas for making things better. I, and then they killed absolutely. him. Absolutely. Like it's like, it's crazy because like they let... It's almost as if they're insinuating at the end that like Post was selected by the leprechaun to be, to be yeah, his yeah, artist yeah, yeah, because yeah. he was capable of outsmarting him the whole way through. And we know that that's not true. Like we know right. that that wouldn't have been possible were it not for like Butch's intellect and Stray's resilience. Like we know that Post mm-hmm. wouldn't have made it through without his two friends guiding him every step of the way being like, yo, we need to stop doing this. We need to sound like this. We need to work on this sound. And then we need to rob mac daddy it's like these were none of these ideas were posts and at the end post is not the post we initially were introduced to he is someone that is you know like 
I mean, yeah, like at the end, they're trying to say that like he is completely controlled by the leprechaun and he's making the leprechaun even more money than the riches that Lep had originally had because now he's a big industry player. And it's, it's interesting because mm -hmm. that again implies that Post is the most deserving in the group to get that to that position. Well, I, I think the, the possibility exists that like we're looking at it through this lens of like where we want to be and what we believe in. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. the, the most people would, would watch that. And I think the intention was, this is the, the good guy because he's like sticking, he's sticking well, to his guns and he wants to make a positive effect on people and he's corrupted by well, this evil. That's exactly, that that's exactly the word I was about to use. It's like Post is actually the most corruptible in the entire group. Mm -hmm. sure. that's, that's what I think it is. Because mm -hmm. like he's the one that is so easily convinced that they should rob Mac Daddy's house. Cause it's like, Stray is never lying about his intentions. Stray's always like, I'm gonna do this. I'm right. gonna rap about right. this. This is what I want. And, and for Butch, he's just like, I'm trying to make the music behind the bars. I'm trying to get this going. I'm trying to like play the music at the shows. I'm trying to make this happen. And like for Butch, he's like, ultimately, if I get laid, that's sick. But here I am being a scientist and doing these things. And that is what is getting me off like right now. And for Stray, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm trying to get famous. That is my goal. I'm trying to get large, as he says continuously in the film. And then like Post is like, I'm trying to be positive. And he immediately lets that fall to the wayside. He lets his friends convince him to rob. He is the first mm -hmm. one to take the flute and use it. He continuously uses the flute. It's like, oh, and once he learns how, it's his flute the whole time. Exactly. exactly. Totally. He doesn't. So there's is, no. There's no sense of. He has the same sin palette as everybody else. For we have all sinned, et cetera, et cetera. But, but like, but, it, he's the worst of the sin. Yes. Because it's all for him. See, this is a thing about movies from that era that now I, I see this emerging in a lot of analysis about like movies that were in the 80s and 90s popular movies sometimes shitty movies but it's like you know when like a lot of movies in like probably even shows where like they write the main character or they write the main protagonist and then they write like the shitty villain girl or they they write the hated character and then you go back and visit it and you're like oh, actually, in the context of my life right now and what I know about the world, the protagonist is a total piece of shit, right? right. right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I notice this all the time in, like, television, especially with, like, characters that they write for women where, like, oh, the good girl sucked and actually, you know, the evil, the evil girl character actually is much more realistic, right? Classic and, like, Disney. In this movie, classic the, wi Disney, the wicked right? complex, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And it's like, with this film, I wonder that about the main character is like, was it written intentionally for him to be this innocent dude who wants, you know, like, to only to bring good things to the hood is the one who in the end becomes bad? Or are they saying something about him from the get? Well, I think like that can be our own reading of it. You know, it's like, at this point, we're doing sort of this like, literary contextual analysis deep analysis which is, this is by the way one of my favorite things i've ever done in my life <laughs> this is what i was born to do is overanalyze really dumb shit yeah like that's <laughs> I the love purpose this. like that's what we were brought here to do <laughs> this is it i got degrees in this it was wonderful it is why we invited you guys on i'm so it's totally why thank you so, glad. so so let me so let me just say now that we've we've talked through this film i think pretty extensively would you go and watch the next one leprechaun six where he goes back to the hood well mm -hmm. i will you know i'll i'll watch him go back to the hood i'll, I'll watch him do it um will i enjoy it gary i don't know but <laughs> will i do it perhaps that's, okay well that's what i'll say will i do it Absolutely not. But well, you're, not going, I mean, you're not going back to the hood. She's <laughs> not going to return. She's not going to follow the leprechaun on his journeys. And I mm. think I can say that confidently because yeah, there's no way she doesn't like. And also, like, I mean, you know, it's. Well, there, it, it's an objectively terrible film. I don't blame you. <laughs> like, it, it is. Like, like you, you know, guys we, can't be we like. We really crushed yeah, yeah. it on our analysis and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. ascribed a whole lot of meaning to some things that were like. 
oops, we got to do something about this like giant problem. <laughs> like, he yeah, yeah, he how does he get out of the safe? Shit. <laughs> it is a terrible. Oh, he just like jumps and explodes this man's chest that's what well do. no he got out of the safe because he called the zombie fly girls right right and they got him out safe crackers all Sa- the obviously there. code obviously. breakers <laughs> so so boshi we've got you on yes uh would watch it again contra hard no hard no well let's you uh earlier there was mention that you just kind of accidentally maybe while getting tattooed caught uh, a Chucky movie back to back with a Leprechaun. Oh, I did. No. I did. It was it was a Chucky movie and then the Leprechaun movie, both of which were like, "Why would you put this on when you're stabbing me with a needle?" It's so sure, absolutely horrible. Uh, I would like to ask a question of you. I'd rather you did. And I'd like I'd and really I'd like Gary dance. to please allow me to also be on the podcast <laughs> with you. Oh my God. All right. Okay. Ask, ask your. Just for once, can you? Chucky or Leprechaun? Who you got? Oh God! Fight? Like it happened naturally, Gary. Wait, oh yeah, fight? it did real natural. It did. To like, fight, yes, yeah, he's fight. saying yeah, to yeah, fight. Yeah. Who wins? Yeah. I would think. Okay, cor- and correct me if I'm wrong. This is because my this genre, this specific genre of horror, I always forget the rules within the movies. But it's <laughs> like Chucky's not like magical, is he? Possessed. I don't He's possessed, right? Yes. And like, but he doesn't have like magical powers, right? He can just like he physically kills people. He can't like Correct. do crazy shit like the leprechaun. Yes, immortality. Okay, well, well, that's hard. Then they both have immortality. Have that. Well, I mean, we've seen we've seen uh, we've seen the lep uh, killed quite a number of times uh, up until this point. So, I, I I agree with that, but I mean, like, he doesn't mind because well, then he gets to be reborn and explode out of people's it's chests. It's not the same leprechaun each time, so, you know. Point of order. Okay. Chucky or leprechaun. Well, okay, okay, so, <laughs> so, okay, so, like, what? So, Chucky can do, like, so, Chucky, Chucky's immortal. Chucky can do, he has, like, super strength. He can do, like, mm. some, some voodoo stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, can Chucky fly? Is that, is that correct? Is that not correct? I think he can jump pretty high. He can I've jump pretty him. high. I've seen okay, it in the first in the first child's play. He attacks in pretty in a pretty serious way. If he can jump really high, that is just strength. Unless he can fly, jumping really high is part of strength. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen the leprechaun jump. Um, but the leprechaun can move objects, can move people, mm-hmm. can do, can create. Uh, create people as well that just like fool you into believing they're real. Okay, so I do have a question before I give an answer as to who could take the other in a fight, which is okay, mm-hmm. so Jackie C comes and is like, hey Jackie D, remember me? And mm-hmm. Jackie D, the fool that he is, assumes that that is his ex partner that he can just get busy with and it's like okay is is this your dead partner is this your ex-partner either way you should be asking some questions as to like how is she in front of me now and so open to boning yeah but he's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I'm just gonna- the, the the bone but, but zone really scary. gets the dudes in this film when it's when it's time to bone they're like okay it's time to bone <laughs> right it is it's- but that's kind of like it was very we'll like, do it in the street Remember like Montel Mori era, like decoy scenario. Remember that when mm-hmm. like they'd always have the decoy and then the guy would like always fuck the decoy with no question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. And and like, it was so weird. <laughs> yes, that's so true. However, like, yeah. but the thing is, no, I know exactly what you're talking about, dude, because I was actually talking about Montel the other day. And it's so interesting because yes, the dude would always fuck the decoy or always hit on the decoy. And it's just like, in like, in, like one, one flat second. And like, how were they in a taxi together? Like, it just made or like, how did you get into her hotel room so quickly? And also, like, are you not worried, like, for your own safety? Like, she could kill you. But like, those shows are so funny because the assumption is that like, a dude in a committed relationship is going to, no matter what, cheat if he's given the option. 
but this right. isn't that right. like Jackie D was with Jackie C like they were mm-hmm. together like I don't know if they were married or if they were lovers it seemed like they were a super couple yeah Jackie C and Jackie D like why would you break that and up? and like she was cute as hell I get it if I saw her in the Agreed. middle of the street it's like okay I'd pull over and talk to her maybe wouldn't like mm-hmm. totally do exactly what Jackie D did because he was really physical really fast but they have a history yeah. my question is mm-hmm. so her face changes and it's revealed that she's leprechaun. So mm-hmm. leprechaun becomes Jackie C. So he can change his own height. He can change his height and his build. Okay. I think a really interesting question that I wrote down in my notes too, which is a follow-up to that question, uh, ties in. What, how, how does he know this person's history? And like how yeah, should, like sure. this dude can see through space and time. It's pretty wild to me. Like, are we, that is crazy. Is, is the leprechaun omniscient? Because that means he has more power than we will ever know. This particular yeah. version of the leprechaun has that, it seems. Because if he's like, if he's omniscient and like he knows Jackie D's history the moment he meets Jackie D and can pretend to be like Jackie D's ex lover, then it's like, mm-hmm. then, then he's more powerful than, than a lot of people, than a lot of characters, right? Like, if you have right. that power, you can do a lot more than the average supervillain. You can do a lot more than the average like horror movie antagonist because while they have a lot of their physical powers and a lot of abilities and a lot of drive, Mm -hmm. not a lot of horror franchise characters have omniscience and can assess one person's entire like history by Mm meeting them. Because I'm not going to say that Leprechaun has general omniscience because that's just too much of the world, too much population, too much. No, I totally, yeah, I agree. But I think if he meets you, he might know everything about you. That's a big deal to me. That's a huge deal. Period. I choose an omniscient being because it's just. Choose a leprechaun. It's just so specific i think it i think it is truly more powerful mm. than any physical power or ability that a supervillain or like um evil person can have like it's like yes super strength flight um immortality those, those are all like huge things that can make you but to automatically know the weakness of a person it makes yeah absolutely because then you automatically know the weakness of the person you're fighting against which would make leprechaun okay. know automatically the weakness of chucky and could weaponize it against him well i want to thank you both so much for being on the show <laughs> it's, it's really good I, to, still, I, got, I gotta hear from Katra too though this is a sticking point for me <laughs> there is like get the mop cut it cut the mics <laughs> cut the cameras cut the mics it was really nice talking to you both Gary's <laughs> like fuck these three it's my show again i hate all of you <laughs> Um, it would be, it would be the leprechaun. Oh, shit. Has the leprechaun never had weed before? I don't think he has. I, I don't get the impression. Or was that particularly skunky jams? But it seemed more like it was he was discovering something. Yeah, I think so too. You know. You know. So did, I mean, like, okay, again, don't start on me on this, like, nothing exists. Everything is stupid and pointless and a lie. But you assume that all of these leprechauns or this one leprechaun, whatever, has been around for a long time. And to not encounter weed seems kind of wild to me. He really likes it, that's he for really sure. It. I he just almost like even forgot to like accost the gentleman who stole the flu. Like yeah. Having a good time and rhyming. Friend with weed is a friend indeed, but a friend with gold is worth more, I'm told. Well put. Uh, the way that he gloms onto marijuana not just as a uh, as as a drug, but as a lifestyle, mm. is incredible. Um, you know, the leprechaun we see at the beginning of the film has no interest in most earthly things. 
you know, he's always had a bit of a, a, a pervy streak across these films. Sure, so it's absolutely. not a surprise that the leprechaun in this film would also be uh, an aspiring super freak. Totally. But the, the move here seemed to be, I'm going to uh, imprison these women uh, with mind control so that they will dance for me and do bidding. There wasn't really an implication that he was going to like bang these, these people. No, I mean, they surprised me like this. You would think this whole series is really gone for once they're in control. He's like trying to get it. I mean, look, there's so many topics we didn't really get to talk about with Cartel Madras, who were fantastic guests, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, is that he transformed over the course of the film into right. the pimp character that is familiar to anybody who's watched black exploitation films over the past few decades. That's a good point. He became the pimp. He was a weed smoker. He was Ice an enforcer was in his transformation too. Hugely influential. And suddenly it becomes more of an organized crime murder spree than a delightful, like, I like do, I like killing people. Sort of. This was sort of more like a prequel, a rise to power, if you will, Makes uh, sense. for him. Because, you know, by the end of the film, he's got his, you know, he's got he's his crew running the hood. He's got like a massive, if we're to believe the crowd response to his hookless formless nonsense mm -hmm. then he's like running the hip-hop game yeah he's he is basically uh, top of his form he has taken mac daddy onassis's place right you know he has uh become his own suge knight-esque character it's a good move business-wise i really love this move for the leprechaun to answer the question at the start of the segment had the leprechaun smoked weed before? I think the answer is no. I I'm don't with think. You, but I do think uh, one thing can be surmised from all of this. And that Which is? He's in love with Garrett Jane. Garrett Jane. Do -do -do. Garrett Jane. <laughs> 